Hello, God bless you. My name is Stephen. I'm the pastor of Graffiti Fellowship Church. We're located in the Coney Island section of Brooklyn, here in New York City. And it's time for today's daily devotion. And our daily devotion series is where we take a chapter from the Bible and read it together. We post these videos five days a week, and then they are there and they're accessible uh, at any time. We're going through in this uh, series the Gospel of John. And we've just started John. This is our second video in the Gospel of John, which means we're covering John chapter 2, because we cover uh, a chapter in each video. Uh, I'm just turning there now. John chapter 2 is uh, it's a fairly short chapter, 25 verses. Um, and <clears throat> not to rehash our last video, which was on the longer side, where we kind of introduced John and what makes John unique compared to the other three Gospels in the New Testament. And it is very unique. Um, but just to kind of summarize that in a sentence or two by way of review, uh, John writes from a different perspective and for a different purpose compared to the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or what we call the Synoptic Gospels. And John is really just going, he's telling about fewer events in the earthly ministry of Jesus, uh, but he's, he's speaking more deeply. He's got a more narrow focus. Half of the Gospel of John focuses on a single week. Um, almost all of John occurs uh, in and around Jerusalem. And uh, John focuses on the deity of Jesus the divine nature of Jesus. And he's giving us uh, a greater understanding of the eternity of Jesus. Where the other Gospels, and, and, and all the Gospels do that, but the other three Gospels focus more on the history and the things that Jesus did. While John does that as well, he's using the history to teach the theology of Jesus and his kingdom. And so that being said, we uh, now read John chapter 2. In John chapter 1, we saw um, an introduction, a prologue, as it's called, uh, where uh, John begins his gospel by saying, hey, Jesus has always been. And the whole world was created through Jesus. He participated in that creation, and then he came to that world he created and was rejected by it. But for those who wouldn't reject Jesus but accept Him as their King, He gives the opportunity to become children of God, to be restored into God's family. And then in chapter 1, we also see the latter half, uh, an introduction to John the Baptist, who was Jesus' biological cousin. John the Baptist's ministry was to let people know that this Messiah they've been waiting for. And we have to understand that uh, the Jews... The really the the hub, the, the central focus of their entire lives has been waiting for the Messiah. Their faith is built around it. And this they they live in a theocracy, so so their faith is their government. So every facet of their personal and civic lives orbits around waiting for the Messiah. And they've been waiting for generation after generation after generation after generation. And John the Baptist says, the time has finally come. Messiah is near. Get ready. And then Jesus comes. So we pick up in John chapter 2. It says, The next day, Jesus has just called uh, certain of the disciples and how we enter chapter 1. The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivity, so Jesus' mother told him they have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come, but his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons, and Jesus told the servants, Fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, Now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. 
When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, although, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said, and then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign of Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After the wedding, he went to, to Capernaum for a few days with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices, and he also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle. He scattered the money changers' coins all over the floor and turned over their tables. And then, going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, What are you doing? If God gave you the authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. What? It's taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. So that concludes John chapter 2. And uh, I want to offer just a little bit of commentary here, not to make this video longer, but I think it's uh, there's something that's really key to understanding here in uh, John chapter 2, and that is precisely why Jesus turned the water into wine. And why it was such a big deal. Like, why did Jesus' mother intervene? Is it so that the party could continue? No, it's, it's, it's much bigger than that. It's much deeper than that. Um, simply put, in the Jewish culture at this time, a celebration such as a wedding had great... Um, social significance and import. It was an important event. And the, the way the custom worked is not only were this couple celebrating their wedding, but they were obligated, almost contractually, to host a celebration. And these celebrations lasted for days, the better part of a week. They were obligated to host a celebration, and they were obligated to invite their neighbors. If they had ever attended a celebration that someone else hosted, they were uh, there was an, an obligation of reciprocity. They were obligated to invite them to their own celebration. And if they didn't, they could actually be sued. And the fact that this wine ran out posed a significant legal problem for this young couple. Now, it's clear the couple are not well-to-do. By today's standards, we would probably say that they were, you know, lower middle class, it seems. And they've run out of wine, and this is a very, very expensive endeavor. But the fact that they've run out of wine, which was immensely expensive, not only means that, you know, it's a party foul, but it means that they were subject to lawsuit. If the guests found out that the party wasn't going to fulfill their expectations, they could sue this couple. And this couple, who are just starting out their life together, stand to lose everything. This event may well bankrupt them. And so Jesus' mother says, Son, you need to help them. And Jesus says, Well, it's not time. She says, Son, don't let them lose everything. And so what we see here 
in Jesus's turning the water into wine is not Jesus turning up for the party. It's an act of compassion and mercy. He intervenes in the life of this couple who stand to lose everything. This event may well affect the trajectory of the rest of their lives. And he steps in and he provides miraculously, mercifully. And his miraculous provision not only meets their tangible felt need, but brings abundance because of the abundance of this wine. They've gone from lack to abundance. And now they have leftover wine of the greatest quality to sell because, again, it's a, it's a, it's a very valuable commodity. And so this couple who stood to lose everything now have abundance because of, because of Jesus and because of the way that He's intervened in their lives and met their tangible felt need. And so this first miracle of Jesus is not about alcohol and it's not about partying, but it's about bringing restoration and mercy to the life of this couple. I don't want you to miss that because that's very important as we start John's Gospel to understand the, the, the kind of provision that Jesus is bringing into people's lives. And He's still in that business and He can bring that level of provision into your life. But you got to make him. You got to make him king of your life. That's really important. Thanks so much for participating in John chapter two. Hope you've been blessed. Uh, feel free to share this with anyone that you think might also be blessed. Hope you'll join us again next time uh, for John chapter three. God bless you.